Thank you very much. Um, today I want to be talking about JSON and web tokens. Does anybody of you already have some experience with JSON web tokens at all? Yes. Yes. <laughs> all right. Is it so confusing? I hope that by the end of this talk it'll be a bit more clear, otherwise we'll talk after the talk as well. So, let me quickly introduce myself. My name is Sam Bellum. I'm from Belgium, not from Skelton, like Johan told me. Um, I'm a developer evangelist at Auth0. And in case you've never heard of Auth0, we're an identity as a service provider, which means that we try to make it as easy as possible for developers, all of you probably, to integrate a secure authentication flow into your apps. Um, so you don't have to worry about that, and you can focus on your product. I'm also a Google Developer Expert. I organize a few meetups, one in Belgium, one in London, and you can find me on the internet as AdSamail. So, most important slide, I have cat stickers. If you want a cat sticker, tweet me a picture of a cat or a dog or any animal, and I'll give you some stickers after this talk. Who wants a cat sticker? I want to see all hands, but most of them is okay. All right. So why am I at, why am I at this conference? Since I told you that I work for a, as a service company, which means that we want to make money with our service. Well, basically, we love open source at all zero. We use a lot of open source packages, and we create a lot of open source packages. We even have a special plan for open source projects. If you need some authentication in your project and you're open source and you're free, you can get a limited free plan, an unlimited free plan from us. We also have an open source portal on our website which lists all of the open source projects we have. You can find it here. Um, and we, we, we um, joined Hacktoberfest last year, which means that if you did a few pull requests to an Auth0 repository, we sent you some extra swag like stickers and a t-shirt. Most of our repositories are on GitHub, there's about 305 of them, um, excluding forks, and together we have 25,000 stars. So this means that we are really invested in doing open source and we try to share as much of, us, of our packages as possible. Um, and 8 to 10 of those are JSON Web Token related, and today I want to be talking about JSON Web Tokens. So let's get started. We're going to see a bit about traditional authentication. Then I'm going to try to explain what a JSON Web Token is, because it's confusing to some people, and by reason. Um, and we're going to see like, um, how a token-based authentication works. So traditional authentication, what do I mean by traditional authentication? It basically is a user goes to your website, and it requests a page, your server does all the heavy lifting, it generates that page, sends it back to the browser, and the user can see that page. But if that page is protected, the user will have to do some logging in, we'll send his email or username and password, we'll send it to the, through the browser to the server, if they check out, the server sends back the page. It will not only send back the page, it will also send a session cookie, because you don't want to log in every time you request a protected page. So the next time you want to access one of the protected pages, you send along the session cookie, if it's a valid session cookie, or if, if the session in the cookie is valid, you just get your page. That's how it used to be done for a long time, and it's still being done. Nothing wrong with this. Um, but if you're working on a single page application, which is mainly written in JavaScript in the front end, you might run, run into some problems. Um, so first, first thing is a traditional architecture. It's mainly just browser, as your server for stuff. Server sends it to the browser. All the logic is handled on the server. In a single page application, you might have something like this. Your application in the front end, there's all the heavy lifting, has a lot of logic in it, and it just gets some data from APIs, like your, your uh, main API, like user API, like a payments API, what have you. You can also have something like this, a mobile app, a web app, a desktop app, and they all need to have this access to the same data, so they all communicate to um, that one API or the multiple APIs you have, but the web is the only API, or is the only medium that uses cookies, because Mobile apps don't use cookies, desktop apps don't use cookies, only the mobile web. So it would be nice if we have a way which is unified across all different kinds of apps to access that data and to prove that we are authenticated, that we are allowed to access that data. So what are some of the problems with traditional cookie-based approach? Cookies don't like cores. Who likes cores? Nice. Because usually there's one people in the person in the room who says, I do but I know they're lying because nobody likes cores. Cookies require state because you need to give a list of valid sessions and you need to check your uh, session in that cookie every time it's uh, being used, if it's still valid uh, in a database or something, someplace where you keep the state. And cookies don't flow. 
you cannot pass a cookie generated by a certain domain, a certain server, to another one. So these session cookies are just for this one server, this one API only. And if you have a multi-server, a microservices architecture, this doesn't really work that well. For example, if your main API needs some data from your user API, it cannot just send a session cookie um, with the session ID from that one server to the other. It doesn't really work like that. So what's the solution? Token-based authentication, maybe, I hope. Um, but let's first see what a token is. To me, a token is a unique identifier representing something. It's just something that you can use to identify that either you're a user, that you have access to something, whatever you want it to be. To me, that's a token. There's a bunch of different kinds of tokens. An access token, I think we've all heard of access tokens before. Who hasn't? Okay, we have an ID token. We've heard of an ID token before. A few of you, okay. Refresh tokens, same question. Some of you, all right. Um, and there's a bunch of different kinds of tokens, but these are three of the most common ones. And they're often op an opaque string in the form of a UUID, which means that they only mean something if you can match that UUID to a permission, to a user, to something. But does it have to be? It can also be XML. For example, if you use a SAML protocol, then you have an XF file object, and it contains some information, and it can serve as a token. But SAML is a bit old. We don't use um, XML as often as we did back in the days. So we are going to look at JSON Web Tokens. At Alt0, we use JSON Web Tokens as much as possible, simply because we love them. So this is JSON Web Token. And as you can see from the different colors, there's three parts of a JSON Web Token. Who's ever noticed that a JSON Web Token has three different parts? OK, that's nice. I can teach you a thing or two, or three. Um, so you have the first part in red, the second one, the middle one, the biggest one, in purple, and then at the bottom there's a blue part. And let's start with the first part. It's called the header, and it contains some metadata, some information about your JSON Web Token, which algorithm is used to sign it, which we'll see later, and what it is. It's a JSON Web Token. The type is JSON Web Token. This information can be used to um, identify what it is and to um, to know which um, algorithm you need to use later to uh, verify or sign the token. The second part is a payload, it's the biggest part, and it's basically just a base64 of a JSON object with, with some data that's useful to you. The subject, most of the time it, that's your user, um, your given name, your family name, your username, when it's issued and when it's expired. And this is something that's really important to know, a JSON web token can know when it expires. Um, that's really useful. So you don't have to look up if it's still valid or not. A JSON Web Token should contain all the information um, if, if it's still valid or not. Like expiry date. There's a bunch of different claims you can put in the payload, and a claim is a key value pair. The first one is reserve claims, and these are just all of the um, keys, key value pairs that are specified in the JSON Web Token spec, like the subject, the issuer, issue that date, and expiry date. There's a bunch more, but these are the most important ones. Then we have a public claim, and these are also claims that are standardized in some way, not by the spec, but by IANA, and IANA has a list of, um, of claims you can use just for API droppability, that if you consume an API from one, country, from one company and from another, these uh, claims should be the same, like given name, family name, preferred username, instead of first name, last name, and username, for example. And the third one is private claims, and it's basically any valid JSON you think is interesting to put inside of this token. Um, it's important to remember that this is just a base 64 coded JSON object, so don't put anything safe, uh, sensitive in this, since everybody can just decode the base 64. So don't put credit card numbers or anything like this in your token. The last part is your signature, and basically you take a signing function pass along the basic support of your header, of your payload, and some secret in case of this uh, algorithm, and you get a signature. This means that JSON Web Tokens can be verified since the signature is based upon your header and your payload. Should you change something in your payload, your signature will be different. So if it doesn't match up with what you're expecting it to be, you know that it's been tampered with, you know that it's not valid anymore, 
But as long as everything is okay inside your payload and header, you can verify that it's okay. Um, instead of a easy to use secret, it's often something seemingly random. Um, so if we look at, some, at an access token as a JSON lock token, it looks like this, or it can look like this, and it mainly contains some information about the access management or rights of an API. Um, it contains when it's expired, but also who it's for, what the subject is, who it's issued with, and which scopes that this user has. If you take in ID token, it contains some more information about the identity of the person that um, was issued this token, like his nickname, his, uh, his real name, a picture to his avatar, so when the user logs in and you receive this token, you don't need to do an extra request to show this basic information on your website. <coughs> now, the previous examples of the signature were used with a symmetrical algorithm. There's also a bunch of asymmetrical alg algorithms to sign um, tokens. The ones here in black, I'm not going to try to pronounce them because it's really difficult. Um, but yeah, the main, the main thing about symmetrical algorithms is that they don't use a secret, but use a private key and a public key. The private key is used to sign them, and the public key is used to um, verify them. So you can pass along these public keys to everybody you want to know who needs to know the, the public key. And it doesn't hurt because they cannot sign uh, a token with a public key, they need a private key. And they're often shared as HAWK, a JSON web key which looks a bit like this. It's some information about your uh, public key, but by using this JWK, this JSON web key, you can verify that the signature is valid. So if you're using the um, OpenID Connect uh, protocol, there is this API endpoint um, defined, which contains a lot of information about your OpenID. Um, let's see. And it's this one. And one of the parts of information that um, it's, it's um, specifies is where to find the JW key, the JSON web key to verify tokens. Um, and in my case, this is my JW key. It's good to know. So it's often a dot well known slash JW key dot JSON if you ever need to verify a JSON web key, uh, web token uh, made by somebody else. So let's make a little comparison. This is a passport of the Kingdom of Belgium in four languages because, yeah, why not? Um, and it contains the fact that it's a passport from the Kingdom of Belgium, and that's about it, some metadata, what it is. The header of a JSON web token is more or less the same. It contains the fact that it's a JSON web token and, and which algorithm is used. If we open that passport, it contains some information about myself, my name, my last name, my nationality, when, I, when the passport expires. And you can more or less... Uh, um, it's more or less the same as the payload of your JSON web token, it contains some more information. And then your signature, it can verify that your password is valid, often some secret uh, ultraviolet light holograms and stuff, or your uh, signature of your JSON web token. So let's see the next action. I have this app right here, which is really useful. It can show me pictures of dogs, um, and they're just free to to you can, you can just um, see dogs without logging in. But if you want to see a cat, cats are a bit more tricky, let's say. You need to log in first. And I just broke it, so let me try again. So if I click on the button, I get a warning. Oops, you need to be authorized for this. So I need to log in. I go through Alt Zero for convenience. Log in with Google. And once I log, I'm logged in, you will see that I magically have my username and my picture on top, which I get from my ID token. But I also have an access token, which I can use to get cats. This is my cat, by the way. Um, so, if you have a simple app like this, you have a simple API, you have an endpoint to get dog pictures, and you will see that I get a new picture at the bottom. You will have an endpoint to get cat pictures, but it tells me no authorization token is found. So I will get a new token with this nice username and password combination. And if, uh, if I copy this and pass it along as a bearer token, you'll see that I can get some cat images. So I basically just take this access token, this JSON web token in, in this case, and pass it along as the um, bearer token for this endpoint. 
If you want to know more about JSON app tokens, it's jwt.io. It's created and maintained by us at Zero, that means by me in particular. Um, so it contains a lot of different and useful information about JSON app tokens. It also contains a debugger where you can paste your JSON app tokens or create new ones. We don't store these tokens anywhere on a the server. They're completely safe and they get... Um, it, it's, it's all been done in the browser, so you don't have to be afraid to paste something in there. Um, and it also contains a whole list of um, libraries in a whole range of languages. If you want to use JSON Web Tokens on the web or in your project, there's, chances are there's a library in this list, open source, which you can use. JWT itself, the website, is also open source and it's on GitHub. So if you feel that there's something missing or something is broken, you can also contribute. Found it here. Um, so are there some downsides to the JSON Web Tokens? Anybody in this room who saw me presenting JSON Web Tokens was like, hmm, but maybe this is not a good part. And if so, what? Okay, let's continue. One of the down parts is invalidation of tokens. It's a bit harder. If I issue a token and it's valid for, let's say, a week, but I want, I, I want it to be not valid for some reason today, it's hard, it's hard to do since it contains all the information if it's valid or not inside of it. So you'll have to create a blacklist or a whitelist which you will check first before um, checking the actual data in your JSON Web Token. And that's a bit harder. If you leak your secret or pri uh, private keys, it can be annoying because everybody can issue a JSON Web Token which is seemingly valid. So don't put sensitive data in JSON, your JSON Web Tokens since it's just base64. On to token-based authentication. We have the same scenario, user, browser, or server. We want to access something protected. We send our username and password. But instead of, of a cookie, we get back a token. And every time we save it somewhere in memory, and every time we want to access something protected, we send along this token, just like we send along the session to key, uh, cookie in the first examples. And we get our data back. This is often with the auth framework. Who's ever used auth before? Okay. Who's ever used OpenID Connect before? OpenID Connect is mainly just OAuth with an identity layer on top. So instead of getting your access token and or refresh token, you can also get an ID token, which contains some more information about your identity. Um, OAuth does not specify that an access token needs to be a JSON Web token, but it can be. OpenID Connect does specify that an ID token needs to be a JSON Web token. Um, so if we look at OAuth or OpenID Connect, we now have a separate um, authorization server just for convenience. We send our credentials, get our, our tokens back. It can be an access token, an ID token, or refresh token. Save them in memory, and we send that token every time we need to access something protected. And once this checks out, we get our data back. But this means that the user will have to log in every time he wants to uh, access something protected because we don't save the, the token somewhere persistently I've mentioned it a few times, we save it in memory, not in local storage or in a cookie like you can find on the internet a lot. Um, so that would be annoying, but it does not mean that the log flow remains the same, we get our, cook our tokens, but it's, as, as something extra we also get a cookie, so we're back to the beginning. And every time the, the user visits your website, um, it will just do requests in the background with this cookie, ask for new tokens, you will get these tokens, and this should be done on Bootstrap, so the first thing you do. And then once you get the tokens, you can do whatever you want to do. This is the auth implicit flow. There's been a lot of fuzz about it. The IETF published a new best practices document stating you should not use it, but the authorization code with proof key for code exchange flow, which is a bit more complicated. Um, so, in essence, you send your user credentials with a code challenge to your authorization server. It sends back a code, you sign this code, um, and then send this code together with a verifier back to your authorization server. And this, ma this makes sure that um, the code is only, issued by, uh, is only used by a trusted source. And once you've done these two extra steps, you get your tokens back. So it's a bit more complicated, but it makes it a bit more secure. So, does this approach solve course with things it does? I do. Because you can pass on tokens to anybody and anybody can verify if they're valid or not as long as they know the secret or have access to your public key. So it doesn't matter which domain, which origin you pass it along to, as long as they know how to verify this token, it will be fine. So it does, of course. 
Does this approach solve flow? The flow of cookies from one server to the other. Who thinks it does? I do, because you're not using cookies, you're using tokens. And again, as long as the other servers know how to verify these, these tokens, you're good. Does this approach solve keeping states? Who thinks it does? Maybe. In, in theory it does, but if you, want to have, uh, if you want to validate tokens and stuff like this, you kind of need to keep some state. If you want to uh, do it a bit more secure and only save the tokens in memory, you need a session cookie, which again is keeping state. So in theory it does, in practice it doesn't. So let's summarize. Using session cookies is hard on single page applications because of session cookies. Stateless authentication is possible, in theory, and HSM app token consists out of three parts. Thank you. Oh, if you want to know more, jsmwebtoken.io. Um, our blog has a nice blog post about why you should not use the implicit flow, but you should use the PKC flow. Our blog is also full of other interesting things. You can find these slides on jwt.sambego.tech. I'll tweet them later. Any questions? Because we still have a bit more time. Questions? No questions at all. No questions. At okay, all. should you have a question, but not at this moment, come find me after this talk and I'll let you Somebody said you should it. bring your own questions to Sweden because we're shy. Okay. Yeah. Belgians are shy as well, so I'm kind of used to this. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you.